Welcome to This Week in Surgery Centers. If you're in the ASC industry, then you're in the right place. Every week, we'll start the episode off by sharing an interesting conversation we had with our featured guest, and then we'll close the episode by recapping the latest news impacting surgery centers. We're excited to share with you what we have, so let's get started and see what the industry's been up to. Hi everyone, here's what you can expect on today's episode. Adam Hornback is the administrator at the North Texas Team Care Surgery Center, and he's here to talk to us about a topic we have not covered yet, real ways to reduce waste and increase recycling at your surgery center. As this is a passion of Adam's, he has tried some really cool and innovative ways to implement processes to reduce, reuse, and recycle, and hopefully you can take some of these ideas back to your own ASC to try out. In our news recap, we'll cover a brand new tech-filled hospital in New Jersey, new smart bandages with nanosensors, the nine most stressful physician specialties, and of course, and the new segment with a positive story about the first patient ever to be cured of leukemia. Hope everyone enjoys the episode, and here's what's going on this week in surgery centers. Adam, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you joining us today, Adam. And I thought we might start out, can you tell our listeners a little bit about how long you've been in the industry? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm married uh, to my wife of, you know, 15 years. Um, Trish and I met in the OR. Um, I have three wonderful children, um, Allison, Deshaun, and Tyler. Um, I've been in the OR for 28 years now. Um, started off in a small hospital as an orderly, um, got the opportunity at this small hospital to work with a surgeon who helped me learn how to scrub. Um, so I scrubbed cases for about 10 years before I went to nursing school. Um, I went down to Parkland, uh, did a critical care residency there. Um, the hours were awful. So had to move out of there, um, went to another hospital in the OR, um, (coughs) excuse me. Um, and I worked there for a while, but I did miss the faster pace of the ASC. Um, so I got an opportunity to go back to the ASC in leadership and I've been there ever since. Um, that was around 2007. Fantastic. So it sounds like healthcare, and the OR in particular is a big piece of your in your blood and in your background. Um, tell us a little bit about North Texas Team Care, where you're at today. And what, what's your specialty mix and what do you guys focus on? Yeah, absolutely. So at NTTC, um, we try to be a leader as far as price tra- transparency. Um, we post all of our prices online and in bundles. Um, we're multi-specialty. Uh, we do everything essentially except for eyes and cardio. Um, we're heavy pain and GI, um, but we're seeing a lot of growth in, uh, orthopedic total joints, uh, and spine. Um, right now we do about 350 cases a month. Um, a large percentage percentage of the cases are cash, which is exciting. Excellent. Excellent. And I don't want to dive into it too deep because we could probably spend a whole episode on, pricing and and price transparency, but I do love the way that you guys have kind of set fixed pricing, extremely transparent, extremely under, you know, easy for a patient to understand. What, what benefit have you guys seen from that approach? Oh my goodness. Um, huge. Um, the ability to make connections with your large companies is, is tremendous. Um, you know, there are opportunities to go out there and get some of the big companies, you know, Walmart and Amazon talk about this style of Mm -hmm. healthcare. Um, so trying to be, you know, a leader in that, in that, uh, in that lane, um, that's kind of where we're, we're growing. We're seeing a lot of growth there and that kind of coincides with the cash bundle pricing. I love it. Yeah, I think that's that's a unique unique model, and it's, it's great to see you're getting some getting some benefits from that. Um, but I will will shift gears here towards why we reached out and what our what caught our eye initially, which was 
your article in ASC Focus specific to your thoughts and NTC's, TTC's thoughts on recycling in particular. And that, that stuck out to us because, you know, we're, we're all about different operational aspects of ASCs and best practices. We haven't seen a lot of thought leadership and examples and case studies as it relates to recycling and waste management. And so I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about that. And is that something that the, the recycling kind of program and, and focus, that, is that something that you brought to NTTC? Yeah, it is. Um, having essentially grown up in the OR, I noticed, you know, all the waste over the years, um, the the drapes, the the sponges, you know, the stuff we would take home to wash our cars. Um, it it really became more apparent as I've gotten older that, you know, somebody pays for that. Um, either the, you know, the it gets passed on to the patient um, or the hospital or the ASC, they, they eat that cost. So, um, I grew up very frugal. Um, so I don't like to see waste like that. Got it. So you, you, you saw, you saw the opportunity, um, and decided to take action on it. And, and how did, how did you go, go about that? how did you kind of turn this from an observation into a program or something that you took action on? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, we kind of started small. Um, we've done this for, you know, throughout several surgery centers, but you start out small, you um, sending the expired um, supplies and implants on mission trips, um, medications, that kind of thing. We, we, we used to do that a lot. Um, they were very popular until some of the organizations that do these uh, trips stop taking the expired stuff. Mm. Um, they, so they needed, you know, current, you know, expiration dates on their stuff, which obviously changes things. We're not a large organization. So we still do specific items. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just not as much as we used to. Um, and then obviously we try to, you know, help with, uh, I know some of the organizations have mission trip organizations that they do. So we try to contribute where we can. Got it. And as you started organizing these kind of waste management programs, you know, the mission trips or kind of the, the, the reuse of, oh. um, of some of the supplies, any, any pushback around that? Did you, was there a blueprint that you could use? Did you find other ASCs that you're doing this or how'd you come up with these ideas that you, you tried? Know, uh, no, a lot of, a lot of the surgery centers, I think do it. Um, not to give too much credit to the competition, but SCA has a great program. Um, that they do mission trips. I think they do several a year mm-hmm. and it's really good stuff. Um, and they, I, they contribute supplies as well as staff. Um, and they give you the opportunity to go, you know, to, you know, all these different countries, you know, and do good. Um, so no, it's not just uh it's in the community and it's, it's strong in the community. Fantastic. And what about kind of your old bread and butter recycling? and, and uh, kind of waste management from a recycling perspective. Is that something that you guys do? Yeah, it is. So <clears throat> that uh, that's a little more of a struggle. Um, the city that I live in um, has a recycling program for residential, um, but they do not have a business, you know, solution. Um, I've talked to them, you know, they've talked about, yeah, we can get you a, a, a big recycling bin, but you got to build an enclosure, <laughs> You know, it's it's very cost prohibitive. Um, so I kind of did a workaround. Um, I put bins throughout the facility um, with signage. And, you know, essentially it's hard plastics. Everything's clean um, and cardboard. <coughs> and what I do is I take it home and I put it in my recycling bin. Oh, wow. Um, and we've done this for a year or two now. Um, and I like to think that it, it makes a difference. Um, but you know, we, we try to do our part. Um, there are a couple of other ideas that are out there as well. Um, over the years, um, veterinarian clinics, usually pretty open to, uh, again, everybody's getting away from the expired and I don't really know why, but, um, they used to take our expired medications as well. Um, they've kind of stopped doing that, you know, for the most part, um, now, 
But the other thing that we used to give them was our used uh, sterilization wrap. And they would reuse that. Um, so there are, you know, different ideas. Obviously, you'd have to have a good relationship with the vet, with the vet clinic and, you know, some trust between you guys. But um, it's been it's been good. Not all are interested, but when, when you can find it, it's, I think it's a good deal. Sure. It sounds like the recycling program, you know, hasn't, hasn't exactly been plug and play <laughs> in terms of, of coming up with, with specialized containers and having to take it home. I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot. Um, what about participation rate from your staff and employees within the surgery center? Do they see value in these programs? They do. They, they give me a lot of grief. It's like the kids. I mean, I have to yell at them all the time. That goes in the recycling bin. You know, <laughs> please don't put that in the recycling bin. You know, it's it's like the children at home. It's, it's no different. Um, it's it's funny. They they give me a lot of grief about it, but they they take it pretty seriously and they try to do it as well. Um, it's always uh, full. So it obviously is doing doing something. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's clearly the right thing to do for the environment. It's clearly the right thing to do from a sustainability perspective. Uh, so it's, it's fantastic. You're kind of taking these initiatives on. Have you found a way to link the effort of what you're doing to the overall performance or bottom line of the surgery center? Because I got to imagine that's a little bit of a tougher stretch. It's tough to get a real number. So I can tell you this. So there, there's twofold. So there's two ways on that. There's two issues. So number one, uh, just the sheer volume of trash that we create, um, boxes, you know, hard plastics, there's a pretty good volume. Yeah. Um, so I would like to think, and we have seen this over time, Due to not throwing that stuff in our garbage, yep. I've been able to decrease my trash pickup by once a week. So I only get trash pickup once a week. So there is a cost savings. Um, it's hard to quantify. It is. Um, most of it is because it makes me feel good. Sure. Um, but there is absolutely, I think, something to um, decreasing the trash that goes in a landfill. Absolutely. So you're at once a week today. Where, where were you guys before? Uh, we were twice a week. That's 50% reduction. You know. Yeah. I mean, it is. Yeah. <laughs> it is. And then the other thing, you know, obviously, I think a lot of people are interested in is solar. Um, we've, we've tried to dive into that. Um, again, uh, very cost prohibitive, even at this point. Um there's, there's a lot of, of little tweaks that you've got to really understand about it. One, and the number one is, is it's only good while it's on, meaning you can use it while the sun is out and you're working. The center is open. Um, there is no battery. That's a whole different, you know, purchase. And right. that is that almost doubles to triples the cost of the, of the, the unit. Right. Um, so it is literally, you know, uh, during working hours, as long as the sun is out. Sure. Which is frustrating. Um, so we're not quite there yet. Um, we're still looking um, because even that would be a, a savings. I think that what I looked at, I've talked to a, <coughs> a couple of different vendors. And what we're looking at is you kind of level out at 10 years. That's the break the even. Right. Yeah. The break even is at 10 years. And then it's a, it's like a 30 year note though. So it's, it's an impressive thing. You know, you start making enough at 10 years, I think that it offsets the cost of it or. Yeah. It, yeah, it's kind yeah. Of I, I've the heard that, that kind of rough rule of my or kind of rule of thumb before too. And so that, that, that's super interesting. Do you think is taking a trade off <laughs> like that, um, how, how do you think your owners respond to things like that in general, where it's like, Hey, there's going to be a, a benefit here, but it's going to take seven to 10 right. years to get there. Is that a tough? Sell? So the problem is, is I was single physician owned and now I've got partners. 
So the single physician was very interested in doing, you know, renewables and, and solar. Um, the problem with it is, is even with our roof being a flat roof, we didn't have enough roof space. Hmm. So in order to get the coverage, we were going to have to add uh, carports with solar on top of them. So there's, you know, additional cost. Um, you don't really see a lot right now. I mean, obviously to me, energy costs are going only going to continue to go up. Yep. So I think at some point it is a good investment. It's just not a clean. It's not yet a know, no brainer. Yeah. It's yeah. not yet. Yeah. And that's unfortunate, but that's kind of where we are right now. Yeah. Got it. That's great. So you've, you've talked about some of the programs you have around waste and expired product reuse, recycling. You've, you've talked about things that, that are under evaluation, like solar. Um, in, any other ideas that you're kicking around, Adam? As far as recycling and kind of renewables, that's really what we're doing right now. Um, you know, reducing waste is the other, you know, thing that we're really concentrated on. Those kind of things are, you know, keeping your preference cards up to date. Um, if something is questionable on a preference card, we don't open it. Um, the surgeons have been, you know, bought into that, um, which is a great thing because not all are. Some of them just want it open um, items. And that's, you know, a cost that a lot of times we don't use. Um, I don't use packs. Um, I don't use the same items often enough that packs make sense in my center. So, you know, often your packs will have, you know, an additional three quarter, you know, a drape or something that you don't use. I don't use them. So we only open what we use. Um, so at the end of the case, there is nothing that has not been used on our tables. Um, I think that's important. And over time, it does make a difference. <coughs> sure. Um, we try to um, use only one brand of an item. You know, we don't have multiple brands of the same item. Um, you know, if we've got a Bovi, we've got one Bovi. Um, and we kind of utilize a most use this kind of attitude and everybody's bought in and it, and it works pretty well for 99% of everything that we do. Got it. Yeah. So you're, it sounds like you're pretty efficient in terms of what you actually use in the surgeries and, and the more streamlined and the more standardized you, <laughs> you are, it, it, may, it makes sense that you can be, be more efficient. Um, I wanted to ask you about, you, you talked about the preference cards and if there's anything on here, that's, that's a question mark, we don't open it. Is that, g give me an example of that. Is that something where uh, a nurse would have a question around, Hey, is this preference card accurate? Or, or how does that come no, into play? No, it is, it, for example, uh, lap coli, where you do a gallbladder surgery. Um, it's laparoscopic. Uh, some guys uh, want an irrigator on there if they pop the gallbladder, or if they get a leak. Well, that's only if you pop it. So I don't need to open it unless you burst it. So those kind of things, you know, I may need this. Okay, we'll have it in the room. That's great. Um, we just don't open it. Got it. So kind of listing out, I'm, I'm envisioning you guys kind of have your preference card kind of organized by kind of almost contingency type items <laughs> versus Absolutely. De definitely Absolutely. use items. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Um, well, well, Adam, one, one final question for you here, and this is a question we ask all our guests every week, which is, can you give our listeners one thing they can do this week to improve their surgery center? Yeah, I thought about this. I mean, there there are obviously several things that we can all improve on. <coughs> I would, just being on the business side of it, most important thing I think to do is to look at your GPOs and your vendor contracts, make sure that they're updated, make sure that they're on contract. They fall off, you know, they're occasionally, they'll go every, you know, so many years and then they'll fall off. Having someone who's knowledgeable, in and watching pricing on items, I think is one of the biggest cost savings on day-to-day -day purchases. Um, you know, if you know that, you know, a pack of towels is $32.96 and the next time somebody tries to order them, they're $69. Well, you know, and that's, that's the kind of thing that we try to do. Um, you know, there's a thousand items, but 
on the day to day items is where you really spend your money. So absolutely keep an eye on that kind of stuff. And, and who who tends to take on that role, right? The bigger healthcare organizations, the hospital systems have big supply chain management and purchasing organizations. They do, and they, they do. And so, we're, not, we're not as lucky. Who, who takes that on? Yeah, so the in, and especially independents, um, you know, we have even less. Yeah. So it's super important that we watch every dime that comes through. Fantastic. Well, Adam, thanks so much for enjoying us here today and really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, man, thank you. As always, it has been a busy week in healthcare, so let's jump right in. In our first story today, Hackensack Meridian is set to open a $714 million brand new state-of-the-art surgical and intensive care tower. They are calling it a smart hospital with 24 operating rooms, 72 post-anesthesia care unit beds, 50 ICU beds, and 175 medical beds. So what makes it a smart facility? They have really decked it out with all the latest tech. There's bedside tablets for patients so they can control the lights, the shades, the room temperature. There's smart TVs with video chat capabilities, uh, monitors outside each room with all the patient information, in-room workstations, six advanced Da Vinci robotic surgical systems, orthopedic robots, robots for joint replacement procedures, and the list goes on and on. We've talked about Hackensack Meridian a couple of times. They seem to really always be kind of on the cutting edge of what's up and coming. But their CEO, Bob Garrett, shared that it's the first hospital that has been built with the learnings of COVID in mind. And it's kind of that piece of it that I thought was really interesting. He didn't go into detail about what that exactly means, but I think just calling out the fact that it was built with COVID protocol in mind is is just really interesting to think about. And if you head to the episode notes and find the link to the article, you'll be able to see a video of the facility. And it's obviously hard for ASCs to compete with a huge budget like that, but there may be some ideas surgery centers can leverage from what this new hospital is planning to implement. Our next story comes from Life Sciences Intelligence, and it's all about surgical site infections. One to three percent of operative patients experience a surgical site infection, which can not only result in the loss of a life, but also an estimated total of $3.3 billion is lost annually dealing with surgical site infections and post-care and everything else that comes with it. So the article does a great job of outlining the types of infections, causes, risk factors, tips for prevention. But what we found most interesting was an update on something called a smart bandage. So early in 2021, researchers at the University of Rhode Island developed the first smart bandage to detect and prevent infection. By embedding nanosensors into the bandage fibers, the, band, the smart bandage can be monitored by a patient or a healthcare professional to try to catch infections early on, minimize antibiotic use, save money, and most importantly, save lives. So while this technology is not yet being used to treat post-surgical infections, future iterations may allow for that route. And you know we love any sort of new tech for the ASC industry, and this one sounds like it has real potential to make an impact. In our third news story, the Labor Department's Occupational Network released the most stressful jobs in the country based on stress tolerance and how important accepting criticism and dealing calmly and effectively with high stress situations is. The most, uh, the number one most stressful job of every job out there was a urologist. Now, the top 20 or so are filled with other healthcare professions, anesthesiologists, acute care nurses, midwives, and more. But if we just kind of narrow it down and look at physician specialties, the top nine most stressful specialties were urology, OBGYN, oral and facial surgeons, neurologists, rehabilitation physicians, family medicine, ophthalmologists, podiatrists, and pathologists. 
So all of that to say, as you all know, being in the healthcare field is extremely stressful, and now there's data to back that up. So make sure you're doing what you need to do to take care of yourself. And to end our new segment on a positive note, a patient with incurable leukemia was cured. According to Positive News, a girl who had been diagnosed with incurable leukemia is now free from the disease thanks to what scientists is, say is the most sophisticated cell engineering to date. The patient, uh, 13-year-old Alyssa, was diagnosed in 2021, and she was treated with all the conventional therapies, uh, but the cancer kept returning, and there didn't really appear to be any other treatment options left. Uh, just this past May, Alyssa took part in a groundbreaking trial, becoming the first leukemia patient to be treated with base-edited T cells. And six months later, Alyssa is in remission at home and looking forward to returning to school. And a trial for the new treatment is currently open. They're still running, and it aims to recruit up to 10 patients who have exhausted all other options. So incredible work. Alyssa, so happy for you and her family, um, and hopefully uh, her experience can be replicated with many, many others. And that news story officially wraps up this week's podcast. Thank you, as always, for spending a few minutes of your week with us. Make sure to subscribe or leave a review on whichever platform you're listening from. I hope you have a great day, and we'll see you again next week. Peace alone.